So I'm um, Lindsay Fluelling. I'm a preservation planner and the certified local government coordinator um, for the uh, State Historic Preservation Office. And then um, Sarah Dahl's also here. She works as a preservation grants outreach, spe outreach specialist for the State Historical Fund. Um, so when you're looking at preservation in your community, it's really important to be equipped with tools to describe why preservation is beneficial and incentives that can be offered in your community to help encourage historic preservation. Keeping um, the conversation going about economic benefits with your property owners and residents is really important. And um, I think it's important to emphasize tangible benefits um, as well as the intangible benefits of preservation. Um, so it's important to be knowledgeable about the incentives that are offered at the state and national levels and uh, make sure that you are able to sort of uh, rebut myths that historic preservation um, lowers property values, um, or that um, historic properties um, are inherently expensive to maintain um, and aren't energy efficient. Um, so it's important to be able to keep in mind that, um, that those things are not true and that um, there's ways to help um, get around some of the costs associated with um, historic properties. Um, and since I'm the CLG coordinator, I should mention that the um, Certified Local Government Program can help open up additional state incentives for your locally designated properties if you're not um, yet part of a Certified Local Government. Um, so why uh, preserve? Some of the reasons that we see are um, to increase community identity and pride, um, reduce waste by using buildings and materials that are already there rather than sending those um, to the landfill and creating all new materials. Um, so retrofitting um, can be really important. Um, preservation helps with increasing jobs um, and spending in your local areas and um, can increase tax revenues in your local areas. The um, Historic preservation construction focuses on labor rather than materials. So it's more labor intensive than new construction, which means more jobs. Um, not necessarily more expensive because um, it, you're just paying more for um, jobs rather than materials. Um, it can have a positive value on property values in historic districts. Um, generally, the impact on property values is kind of complicated, but um, studies have shown that there's no correlation between preservation and lowered property values. We often see steady or increasing values in historic districts. Um, preservation can help lead to downtown revitalization, which obviously as Main Street communities is really um, at the top of everyone's minds. Um, it can help to stabilize your neighborhoods, attract investment, um, help with long-term sustainability and growth of your community, and welcome entrepreneurs, small businesses to your downtown areas. Preservation can also help with heritage tourism, which is an $8 billion industry in Colorado. It's a huge economic driver in our state and across the country um, because people want to experience your history when they're visiting um, your towns. And generally, heritage tourists spend more money than other types of tourists. So this helps to create jobs in your community and hospitality and retail industries. Um, preservation also helps to support small businesses and mixed use properties because um, those buildings are already there um, and don't have to be newly constructed and also can help with affordable housing. Um, so just uh, briefly looking at some different levels of incentives that are available for preservation. On the federal level, level there's the um, rehabilitation tax credit that's offered for um, National Register properties with income producing uses and um, Sarah is going to talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, to go along with that, um, the low income housing tax credit um, and the new markets tax credit are also often paired with the rehabilitation tax credit for larger projects. At the state level, um, we have the State Historic Preservation Tax Credits. Um, the program is for residential and commercial property rehabilitation. And again, Sarah is going to um, touch on that uh, briefly in a little bit. Um, the State Historical Fund offers rehabilitation um, funds. 
and then um, state incentives through the Main Street program, which you guys will all be familiar with. Um, so, for example, there's technical assistance with your Main Street architect, Larry, uh, who's on the call, um, and they can also help um, help you guys to brainstorm additional funding sources that might be available um, that are applicable specifically to your community. Um, there's also a revolving loan fund at the state level, um, which is through the Colorado Historical Foundation. They offer low interest loans for rehabilitation um, to designated properties. Um, also at the state level, there's um, enterprise zone tax credits. Those are um, to help encourage development in economically distressed areas of the state. They provide tax credits for vacant commercial building rehabilitation, um, investment, and new employees, and offer bonuses for rural areas um, if you're part of an enterprise zone. Colorado also has opportunity zones. Those are to encourage long-term private investments in designated low-income communities by giving investors tax incentives for investing in real estate projects and operating businesses. And then again, the low-income housing tax credits that are um, offered through the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority um, as part of the federal program. And then other alternative financing methods that could be offered as an incentive, such as um, CPACE. So that offers um, owners of eligible commercial and industrial buildings to finance their energy efficiency, renewable energy and water conservation improvements. Um, and that goes through your county. Um, so all these different things can be um, looked at and offered, um, some of them just specifically for preservation projects, but some of them for um, development more generally in your communities. And then um, you can also think about local incentives that you might want to offer um, on top of those things. So um, thinking about creating an incentives package that you can offer for your um, historic property owners. And those include things like um, sales tax rebates or waivers building or planning permit fee waivers, property tax rebates, um, exemptions and variances to your um, zoning code, um, technical assistance, easements, lower zero interest loans for uh, construction, um, grant programs, and then having preservation awards and recognition. And I'll talk about each of those um, in a little bit, um, but for now I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Lindsay, and I'm going to share my screen, nope, this one. All right, and can you see that? Yep. Okay, <laughs> thanks. All right, well, hi everyone and good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Dahl and I am currently one of the outreach specialists for the State Historical Fund um, here in History of Colorado. Uh, Lindsay's program, my program, um, work on several um, projects together or we kind of help um, one project start and um, <clears throat> pass it on to the other person. So um, I'm gonna start with the State Historical Fund first. Um, we are funded through the three gaming towns here um, in Colorado. It is based off of the tax res revenue from um, the gaming. So Central City, um, Cripple Creek, and Blackhawk. Um, so if you're in one of those, um, the if the property is owned by the city, it will not qualify for the, ta uh, for the state historical fund. Um, but if it is located within those city limits, um, then certainly come come speak with us and we can um, talk about a potential project. We have two different types of grants. We have our non-competitives and our competitives. So the first one I'm gonna talk about here is our non-competitives. We have five different grants that fall under what we call our non-competitives. We have our historic structure assessment, um, archaeological assessment, survey plan, planning um, grant, and the micro grant. Um, the historic structure assessment, um, those are really great grants for um, those who really don't know where to start with their project. Um, on their building, they see that they have several issues um, and they're just kind of looking for a way forward. Um, this is a uh, grant helps to pay for a professional architect certified in Colorado or license in Colorado to come create a, um, a, a larger document. 
uh, that helps provide the guidance. It goes over from top to bottom, inside out, um, all the components in your building, and then it'll end in a priority list based on the critical, severe, and minor deficiencies that have um, been found. It will also provide you with a phasing plan so um, that is always helpful for those who really don't know where to start and they're trying to determine, well, really, how long is this going to take us and kind of um, what, what the cost might be. We also have the archaeological assessment. Um, these are obviously for archaeology sites. Uh, they are a great start to um, determining uh, the level of um, reporting or the potential for um, artifacts to be found on site. Um, there can be, most times this is for um, just research and um, a, a big one is ground penetrating radar. So you're not uh, disturbing the ground, um, but you can definitely uh, start with this and it'll help guide you on the what, ne what needs to happen at the site if you're thinking archaeology. For the survey plan, um, this is a great first step um, to determining well, what do you have in your, in your town. This can be um, downtown, this can be residential areas, kind of where do you need to focus on um, determining what historic um, buildings you might have. And then for the planning grant, we this is a rather newer one. Um, this is to help um, applicants uh, apply and pay for a professional consultant to do, um, say, a state or a national register nomination. Um, because if you haven't done one of those before, they can be quite um, a lot of work. And so we try to help applicants by being able to hire someone who professionally writes these and. Um, can uh, help pay for that. Um, another popular item is design documents. Um, this can be schematic designs, um, planning for the design or the construction documents. Um, this was to kind of help allow a little bit more flexibility for projects and to have your planning part done um, before applying for larger grants. And then we have our micro grant, which um, is for just quick um, work. It is a uh, grant request match max of 5,000 with a 50% match. So if your project total is 10,000, you can grant request five, or five and then you match it with five. So it's a 50-50. Um, and so those are meant for quick, easy, easy projects. Um, so the requirements for the non-competitives, um, eligibility, nonprofit, government entities, um, we can even fund private owners. Um, and But with private owners, you must have a nonprofit or government entity applying your behalf. Um, since our funds are public um, funds and we really wanna make sure it has that public benefit and um, by having a nonprofit government entity apply, that kind of increases that um, component of it. Um, as for your cash match, um, it is 10% um, for your nonprofits, government entities, 25% for your um, private owners. Um, that is based on the ownership of the site. So even though you have a nonprofit applying your behalf as a private owner, it's still that 25%. Um, so if you have um, a privately owned property that is being leased by a nonprofit, um, it must be a long-term lease of 40 years. Um, and so there is also that um, option. And so if you're not sure, totally uh, just get a hold of us and we can help you determine what that cash, what you can expect your cash match to be. Um, and then as for designation um, for the historic structure assessment, archeological assessment, um, survey plan and planning, um, that you do not have to be designated at the time of application, but you must show that you are moving towards designation. Um, and then for the micro grant, if you're doing physical work on a building or you are excavating an archeological site, then um, it must be designated at either the local state or national level.
Um, and then here are some great photos of some projects that we worked on. Um, we have Riverside Block, which is privately owned in Pueblo. Um, they are currently um, doing a micro grant um, and they are located within a National Register District. So they are con considered contributing. So they are designated. Um, we have Roseland Cemetery. This is where um, a project where they did the ground penetrating radar um, to determine uh, where their uh, three mass um, burials were within their cemetery. Um, so that's a great public benefit because it builds upon um, information of um, Pueblo area and makes it available to the public. Um, and then Greeley completed a survey plan. Um, it was a mix of commercial and residential. So you can do a little of both, kind of whatever your need is. Um, and then we have Yeaman's Hardware out in Akron, which is in um, Washington County, where they are currently um, in the middle of completing construction documents for the exterior in hopes of the next phase of physical work. Uh, and then our second type of grants are our competitive grants. Um, these are for much larger projects. Um, and the uh, we have two, two um, types of general grants. We have our smaller mini, which is a re grant request of $1 up to 50,000. And then um, we have our larger grants, um, competitive grants, which we call generals, which is grant requests of 50,000 and $1 to 250,000. Um, if you are doing physical work, um, it must be designated. So that is part of your requirements. Um, eligibility, um, nonprofit, government entity, private owner, um, same, same um, requirement where you have to have the nonprofit government entity applying your behalf as a private owner. Um, and then, like I said, the designation, it must be designated at the local, state, or national. And if you don't know, totally ask us. Um, and then your cash match, it bumps up. So it's a 25% cash match for nonprofits and government entities, and then 50% for private owners. And um, the cash match is based off of um, your project total. So we'll do easy math, because I like easy math. Say your project total is 100,000 um, and you are a nonprofit, your cash match is 25,000 and you are grant request of 75,000. So um, pretty easy, um, uh, but it's easy to mess up also. So just make sure you're getting your numbers right. Um, and then here are some other um, uh, project photos. We have the Hugo Roundhouse where they completed um, three phases of their exterior uh, work on their roundhouse. Um, we have the Uncompendre Plateau, which is a um, archaeology project where they were researching a certain area. Um, then we have the Hanta Masonic Lodge, uh, which is uh, owned by the three counties and their district attorney will be moving into that. Um, and then we have the Spruance Building, which is privately owned. Um, and we completed work on the exterior um, for these buildings. And as for um, diversity, equitability, and inclusion, um, the State Historical Fund has been taking a more active role in um, including, uh, for short, D DEI into our grants. Um, and so, we really want to know um, what our communities need from us and how to um, really build upon um, those needs and uh, making sure those communities um, are being uh, served and receiving those um, and receiving funding. So there is an extra 10, well, not an extra 10 points, but there's 10 points um, in the application set specifically for the DEI component. So. If you're in a community um, that has maybe a higher uh, population of what we are calling um, BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color, um, then you could qualify for a lower cash match, um, which we have built into all of our grants. So for the non-competitives, um, if it is a um, primarily BIPOC serving, then it is a 0% cash match. Um, 
for a nonprofit government entity, 10% for a private owner. And then for the competitive, we've made it to where if it's a nonprofit government entity um, with a um, operating budget of less than 250,000 um, a year, then it's 0%. If it's their annual budget is larger than 250,000, it is 5%. And then for all private owners, it is 10%. So um, that can make quite the difference, um, especially since we recognize that um, a lot of those communities might not have the capacity uh, to either fundraise for the um, for the cash match or even have the um, capacity to write the application. So we are trying to make it a little bit more accessible, accessible to all. And then tax credits. Um, so this picture right here is of the Brush Central School. So you might know it, um, others might not, but it has been vegan for quite a while. Um, they are currently applying for a state historical fund grant and state and federal tax credits. So we will get into um, giving about a, a basic overview of what those programs are. And then um, similar to what Lindsay introduced um, with and how they kind of fit with everything else. Um, so what does it take to qualify for a tax credit? Um, you must be individually designated or contributing to a district. Um, and so it depends if you're going for the state or federal, um, which I will cover those in the next couple of slides. Um, if the site isn't designated, that doesn't mean it can't qualify. Um, definitely call, um, call us and we'll help you through that process, but it could be um, one where the tax credits aren't always guaranteed. Um, and so you could say you're gonna do the work 100%, um, but you never know until that project is complete. So it could be potential you complete the project and then um, get it, have it designated, but um, it's kind of a tricky tricky process. So um, it's easier if you just call staff and we can talk it talk it through for your your unique project. And then um, all work uh, for both the state historical fund grants um, for the physical work and for the tax credits must meet what we call the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, and these standards are just guidelines um, that as the state um, historic preservation office, we are to follow. Um, so most times um, it is uh, guiding for what is best for the building and most times it's what you want. Um, so uh, for example, we wouldn't want to see, say your roof is um, clay tile. We would not want to see you replace it with um, uh, a shingle roof. Uh, so just, just things like that. Um, just wanna make sure that what you're doing is appropriate and that you're not really changing that historic um, appearance of the building and just kind of taking away all this, what makes it historic. So. Um, always best just, just to talk to us about, hey, I have this project and this is what I'm thinking of doing. Um, would this be considered qualifying? And then those credits are based on what is the qualified rehabilitation expenses. Um, again, that is a certain percentage of what the work is complete. So um, we'll go over the certain percentages for each of the programs um, here. And then again, we'll do some simple math. <laughs> uh, so we have the residential tax credits, um, and this can vary from 20 to 35% for, um, for owner-occupied residencies. Uh, this depends on if the property is in a rural or urban area, and also to factor in the disaster, what area is considered to be disaster um, relief. So there is a special um, additional percentage in Colorado um, and so that, um, we have, we have a list of those counties and areas. So again, contact us and we'll help determine if your property is rural, urban, um, and then if it falls within that disaster relief area. And the work must exceed, um, 5,000. So, um, that's kind of an easily met, um, threshold. And then your application is reviewed by either your certified local government, CLG for short, which is the program that Lindsay 
um, manages. So if you're not sure if your town or city is, um, definitely uh, reach out to Lindsay. Or if they aren't, um, they come to our office to History of Colorado. Then for the commercial state tax credits, pretty similar to residential. Um, there's that 20 to 35%, um, but the properties are income producing. Um, and then they must be designated at either the local or state um, level also. Um, the work for that must exceed 20,000. Um, and so that might be a little bit harder to achieve, um, but if you have a substantial enough uh, project, then it, it will. Um, and then your application is reviewed by staff here at History of Colorado. Um, and then it is approved by the Office of uh, Economic Development and International Trade um, to have those credits reserved and to move forward with you receiving those credits. Then we have the federal tax credits. Um, they're a little bit different. Um, for the state, there are certain uh, amounts of money in the pools that for every um, fiscal year. And so the earlier in the year you apply, the more likely chance you will be um, have your credits reserved for that year. Um, but as for the federal tax credits, there isn't a limit. So um, you can, your work, 20% 20, 20 of your work for income producing properties. Um, and they must be designated at that national level. So um, the, the state, you can do either, they can be local, state, or national, but for the federal, they have to be national, individually designated at the national level or within a national register contributing district. Um, but, and again, there um, is no cost limit on what the project, it's based off of um, <clears throat> various numbers. Um, and based on those numbers, you want to make sure that it's worth your time, that the work that you're doing is going to actually um, not just break even, but you'll actually have um, some, um, some actual worth coming back in those tax credits. Then again, your application, it comes to History of Colorado staff, um, and then it is also moved on to the Technical Preservation Services at the National Park Service out in Washington. Um, so we could do some simple math. Um, we'll just stick with income producing. So say it's on the National Register, um, such as the Belvedere Theater here, um, who's coming in for state and national tax credits. Um, that would be, uh, well, we won't do the Belvedere. We'll do the brush school. That one's easier since they're doing the uh, state or grant too. Um, so they're in a rural area. They qualify for the 35% at the state level and then the 20% at the federal. So 55%. So say they have at least 100,000 in um, dollars in qualified expenses, they get 55% back. Um, so 55,000. Um, and though that, um, those credits can go back to their property taxes. So um, it really kind of helps those who do have a lot of um, larger, more expensive properties. So um, again, we can talk more about the different um, ways that you can acquire them. Some you can sell, some you can't. It just depends on the project and, and the ownership. So um, let's see. Um, yeah, to continue the conversation, I see Tracy put our emails in the chat. Um, happy to talk about um, grants, tax credits, um, about how to pair them. You can do both tax credits and grants. So like I said, the Brush Central School is doing both. Um, and so we can talk about the timing of utilizing both of the programs to um, the max capacity. So um, again, if you have any questions, certainly just email um, or give us a call. Um, thanks, Lindsay and Sarah. Um, does, it, uh, do you, does anyone have any questions right now for um, uh, either of our guest speakers today? Um, I, I will add um, that I believe in Sarah's current role as outreach um, for the State Historical Fund. Um, I always know, um, I always hear from every funder that they love to hear people from people about their projects, their thoughts about um, before, before you even put in an application and they will help 
you um, make the best application as possible. Do you want to elaborate on your role in outreach right now, Sarah? Oh, yes. And then, yes, definitely. So, um, yeah, I'm currently the State Star of Fund Outreach. Um, we love our jobs, and so we love chatting about projects. So um, even if you aren't sure if it qualifies for a grant um, or who to contact, um, always happy to be that contact if you need it. And then if I um, find that it's in a certified local government, I normally will pass it on over to Lindsay, if you have questions about that, or um, if you need designation information, pass you over to that staff. But um, we really enjoy being part of your part of your projects and building those relationships. Um, and so we just really want to make sure that um, you feel comfortable coming coming to us with anything. <laughs> and we I, and love I, visits too. So uh, it doesn't always have to be virtual now. And I know people feel so awkward about it, but, um, you know, yeah, get to know the people who might be funding you. That's, it, it can only help. So <laughs> thanks for elaborating, Sarah. And uh, Larry put a question in the chat about the Brush School, um, uh, wanting to talk a little bit about how difficult it is for a private owner to receive SHF grants, um, et cetera. Um, would either of you care to elaborate on private versus nonprofit or public use for grant applications? Uh I think, well, I think we both can. Um, I can kickstart it. Uh, so the private owner, um, they recently acquired the Brush School. Um, and how they did that, they worked with um, the Chambers of Commerce there in Brush. Um, Brush is also a certified local government. Um, and so they had um, started the process with SHF. Um, and then it was sold to this private owner. And um, yes and no to Larry's question. Um, the stronger the public benefit, the better. Um, so as a private owner, like if we have someone who comes in for their own personal house, that's not as competitive, um, but we always wanna talk about your project. And uh, we, if it's privately owned, we really like to see the exterior work. So things that are public facing. Um, so this private owner um, for their SHF grant is for the exterior facade and work on, um, on the masonry. Um, but then for the tax credits, they can do inside and outside. Um, there's not that um, concern of how the public is benefiting um, and whether that is aesthetics or um, health and safety. So maybe you have a building on your main street that has some crumbling uh, sandstone seals. Uh, yeah, that you can totally use that as, hey, we really need a grant to fix this. And um, our urgency is the safety of pedestrians and our public benefit is, is aesthetically healing and um, it will no longer be a concern to the public. <laughs> And I see Cynthia has raised her hand. <laughs> I'm going to want to. There we go. There we go. Unmute. Yes. Um, hey, Sarah, I've never got, gotten the opportunity to meet you, so but it's a pleasure. And I really am enjoying your presentation as Lindsay's. Lindsay, I, I have... I haven't really met Lindsay, but we're CLG, so we've worked a lot, and Lindsay's been just a rock star. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I've got basically just wanted to let you know of a couple of projects that I think you might know are coming down the pike here in La Junta. Uh, one of them, we had a uh, apartment building that is, um, according to Erica, as well, um, uh, Warzel is has a possibility of being listed on the National Register. Um, she's she's doing a survey down here right now and gave us uh, one of the, the slips. But anyway, it recently was purchased. Thank heavens, it's been sitting there rotting for years. And um, I know that they need a roof and some other work, so we're probably going to be coming in for that. It is privately owned. Okay, so we're probably going to want to go for tax credits too. Um, the other one I think you're aware of, I think you were in on the phone call for the Elks building, which needs everything. I mean, it needs the windows, it needs the roof, it needs, you know, um, repointing. Um, it, it, it's, it has efflorescence on the inside in the dining room. 
I mean, it, it's just, it's packed with every single question you could have on, you know, a building sort of doing unusual things. My question on the Alps building, and we never really brought this up previously, um, but I, I'd like to know with, with um, uh, Danielle, um, is that considered to be a public building? I mean, does it, it, it provides public services, but would you consider, or would you limit the work that's being done to the exterior? Uh, so it's one of those that's similar to like, you know, the Masonic lodges or whatever. Um, I think with the Elks, they have, do they have like there are rooms that are sectioned off that just if you are part of like you are an Elk part, you know, you can go in and like the general public can't go in. I think you're supposed to be an Elk member in okay. order to go in. I, I've been here four years and um, a month and a half ago was my first time to go into the Elks building. I hadn't tried. I mean, it, Elk, the Elks do a lot of um, um, beneficial work for children, uh, giving scholarships and clothing and all sorts of things like that. So they do do public benefit types of things. They have a pretty good spread in terms of dealing with underserved communities. Okay, and, and, and also the partnership is pretty good. I mean, mm -hmm. I checked it all out. I said, listen, if, it's, if, it's, if you're just one kind of person who goes here, it's not gonna work. So, so anyway, met all those requirements, but you know, they don't open it up and, and yeah. say, come on down. You know, I, I know anyone yeah. and everyone. Yeah, yeah. Think, well, definitely the exterior and then any, any of those public spaces that they do have. So they are, you know, um, active with the community and have events, which, um, so maybe like the lobby space or some places that they can actually go in. So if they have like their lodge or um, like their own room, um, probably would not be as competitive. So like ADA bathrooms, they have some bathrooms on that first floor, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'll check and see if they rent it out to people, which would be a public space and, and would probably help out in the other thing. Other question, um, anybody who knows my grant writing knows that I always want somebody to read the draft before I turn Ooh. it in and to rip it into tiny little shreds. Do you do that? Thanks, Cynthia. Yes, you are. <laughs> you're familiar with that as a job. I like your questions. I mean, like you don't. No, but um, yeah. So the SHF, we do um, provide a draft review. Um, we do have a deadline on when those need to be in, um, but we also started a letter of intent process. Um, that is found on our website, or you can just email me and I'm happy to send you a link for it. Um, and then, yeah, once you have the approved letter of intent, you can start working on the application. And um, like Cynthia was saying, we read drafts. Um, we provide comments as staff um, just to try to help you. So especially if you're new to whole grant writing, um, that could be a, a great um, resource for you. I think even if you're experienced in grant writing, that's the way you get grants approved. Yeah. And if, <laughs> yeah, you have a, you have a, a higher opportunity. Yes. And then um, we also catch those little things to make sure, yeah, your work does qualify. And um, kind of same with the tax credits. Again, if you have a project that you kind of, um, that you're thinking about, you're not quite sure um, if it would um, meet the standards and be approved, definitely um, you can reach out to us and we can brainstorm on how to bring it into um, compliance with the standards or um, we can just talk, talk about anything that you want with that project, so. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, I see Kim has her hand up now as well. Morning, everybody. Morning. Sarah, I'm glad to meet you in real life. I can, I can attest personally to um, Sarah's enthusiasm and skill at outreach. You can tell that you, that you enjoy it. Um, my question is I'm working right now on the, the SHF application. I have a feeling that I'm a little bit out of order because I'm because <laughs> I have it I have it finished except for bids. So my first question is, is there any resources that you guys can provide for um, contractors who would be would who would be the right the right kind of contractors that I can reach out to and get those bids? Definitely. Yes. Yeah. We do have a list of um, contractors, architects, consultants, um, basically anything that has to do with preservation um, work. We do have lists um, of people who have worked on our past projects. Um, by no means is it a referral or, you know, a recommendation. Um, you still have to do the legwork and call 
um, the individuals, but it gives you kind of where their, where their office is based out of, where they've done other projects. So um, definitely we can share, share those lists with whoever. Um, so you can just email me what, what your needs are, if it's an architect or not, and um, we can connect you. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Good deal. I, I feel like Larry is my first contact in that situation right? Any, yeah. any sort of preservation architectural. So I, I emailed him. I'm done. Like I said, I'm, I'm finished with the application with the first draft um, besides the bids. So yeah. also when you said that letter of intent, I had no idea. Um, oh, it's, only for, it's only for our competitive grants. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, good. Cause you're with Victor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And also yeah, you've been awesome. I was super confused <laughs> about re 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 um, getting back into my underway application so I started like 12 more applications because it so and you were awesome <laughs> helping me figure that out yes so, yes so um I think that's all I have right now this is a great presentation I'm learning a lot this is awesome so thank you for being yeah here. I actually I think didn't Lindsay Lindsay didn't you have like a second part and I always I always find it like super helpful like her little insights about what other um like what certified local governments have done but what main streets can also do so i don't know oh please yes Lindsay, take take over uh, sure i mean i'm happy to um keep answering questions as well so if that's more helpful then that's fine too <laughs> yeah. well maybe a quick one from talitha hello this is talitha and sky here in trinidad colorado <laughs> um i was wondering with your diversity equity inclusion points how is that um, measured or calculated? Is that basically looking at census data for the whole community or is it really about specific applicants or do you have to make an argument about who specifically benefits? Yeah, yeah. So I can definitely elaborate more on that. And it is um, still a work in progress. Uh, we've been out for maybe a year now, um, but it is, I, yeah. When talking to applicants, I say, if you have to struggle to meet the meet, like meet that, then the chances are slim. But I kind of also tell people there's three things that if, if your site um, has these three things. So was it historically um, significant to, um, I'm going to say, a BIPOC community? Um, is it currently serving um, primarily a BIPOC community? And three, are your contractors, architects, those firms, are they um, also uh, BIPOC, maybe BIPOC owned or majority of their um, staffing is BIPOC? So um, one instance that meets um, um, one of them, so the Plaza Block in La Junta, um, they are obviously in um, Hispanic is more of the majority of the um, makes up the population there. Um, and so a lot of their programming um, is uh, the demographics of those who are in those programs are higher Hispanic. They have tons of programs that are going to be using this space. So they use that as their argument to meet that <clears throat> DEI work. Um, we have a project down in the St. Louis Valley. Um, it's a potato barn. It's privately owned. The owner his family has lived there for generations um, and they are um, Hispanic background um, and they have a local contractor who is also um, uh, Hispanic. Um, we are, re are currently in the process for a nomination. So one of those planning, non-competitive planning grants um, in Pueblo for the first AME church. Um, it's, uh, it is African Methodist, um, uh, yep, blanking on that one. Episcopal, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was just like, oh my gosh. Um, so you would automatically think, oh, they are, you know, probably have a higher um, demographic of Black, but they're in a higher Hispanic neighborhood. So they are um, claiming that they both, they're serving all, but um Black and um, Hispanic are their two big communities that they serve. So um, it depends on your project also. So always happy to, you know, if you 
not sure, then ask. Um, but Trinidad, again, is very similar to Pueblo and um, kind of has that higher um, majority of um, uh, in communities I claim um, to be of Hispanic, so. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any more questions before we turn this back over to Lindsay for, for a few minutes? Okay, excellent. Take it away, Lindsay. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit more about local incentives <clears throat> programs that our certified local governments have put into place that might be ideas for layering with these um, state and national incentives. So I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so uh, these would be generally for locally designated um, historic properties. And it's really important to be clear about different um, design review processes that these properties will need to go through when they're um, rehabilitating a designated property and that the work um, should meet the Secretary of Interior standards in order to qualify for different incentives. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through some of these incentives um, and give some examples of programs in our different um, certified local governments. Um, these were mostly offered at least up until 2019, and some of the programs had to be you know, put on hold for COVID, but at least it'll give you a good idea um, of what's going on in different communities. Um, so one is a sales tax rebate or waiver, and this is a rebate or waiver of local sales tax for construction and building materials um, used in preservation projects and purchased locally. Um, it's a relatively small incentive to get started with offering a benefit to property owners. So it wouldn't have a huge budgetary impact for the government, but it, um, it's something you can offer um, potentially. And um, some of our CLGs that offer a sales tax rebate or waiver are um, Blackhawk, Boulder, City of Boulder, and Steamboat Springs. Another um, potential local incentive would be building or planning permit fee waivers. Um, so this would cover um, part or all of the building or planning permit fees for work on designated properties. Um, and we have um, examples of that in the city of Boulder, Montrose, and Steamboat Springs um, offering um, either building permit fee waivers or planning um, permit fee waivers. Another um, potential local incentive to think about is um, property tax rebates. This is a full or partial refund of property taxes for designated historic properties. Um, this might be easier to implement if you're within a county, but obviously if you're um, in a town or city, you'd have to work with your county in order to get this into place. And it could be things like um, giving a refund fund of um, property tax increases due to rehabilitation work so that you're not um, disincentivizing rehabilitation work on your properties um, over a certain period. Um, or um, like Littleton offers a 50% property tax um, rebate for contributing properties in their local um, district, their Main Street district. Um, so there's just um, different programs um, around the state that you um, could look at as examples. Um, our biggest incentive that we see different communities offer for um, preservation is exemptions um, from local regulations, um, such as setbacks or parking or variances on zoning requirements. Um, a lot of communities do this with their historic properties without it being, um, you know, even something that they necessarily recognize. Um, but if you are able to pinpoint what you're, what you're allowing to happen anyway, then you can um, work with your property owners and um, sort of advertise that as an incentive, even though you're already doing it. Um, so that can be allowing um, historic uses to, um, to stay in place, even though um, they might not be currently allowed in your zoning code. Um, uh, there's all sorts of different examples of um, increased density in historic properties, um, variances to setbacks. Um, parking is often a big problem with historic properties, so you could have parking um, exemptions for, uh, for historic properties. Um, all sorts of different things you could do with your zoning um, to help 
uh, help get these historic properties back into use. And I um, have a list here of all of the different um, CLGs that offer those um, exemptions and variances kind of explicitly, but um, I think many offer them in practice for their historic properties, even when they're not specifically labeled as incentives. I think when you do label them as incentives, it shows your willingness to work with um, people who have more, sometimes more difficult properties. Um, so uh, it could be just a good, a good way to conduct outreach to your property owners. Another um, local incentive is um, technical assistance. So that could come from your local staff, but it, you have to keep in mind that that could create conflict if your staff is also reviewing projects for certificates of appropriateness. Um, so uh, it might be better to offer um, small grants for technical or design assistance from a professional consultant like an architect or an engineer, or you can um, offer that through the Main Street program with um, Larry as your contact. Um, often the technical assistance is focused on facade improvements. Um, so we have our uh, CLGs that currently or have in, uh, in the recent past offered that technical assistance um, to help uh, improve their um, local uh, designated properties. Another um, local, well, another incentive that could be offered are um, historic preservation easements. These are voluntary legal agreements that permanently protect the historic integrity of a designated property. And they also offer certain tax benefits for property owners who donate an easement. Um, it could be um, something that you could help your property owners with if they're concerned about um, their property changing over time after they no longer own it. Um, so for example, I had an inquiry um, from someone who owned a centennial farm and they were worried about their farmland being, um, well, their farmland being sold off and then their uh, historic uh, residence being demolished. So if they were able to get an easement on that uh, residence that could help protect it in perpetuity, even if the land, the farmland around it is um, developed. Um, and those um, easements, some organization has to take responsibility for them and monitor property for compliance. Um, so there are different organizations that do that, such as Historic Denver and the Colorado Historical Foundation. Um, another potential local incentive that could be offered are zero or low interest loans for rehabilitation of historic uh, designated properties. And we have several communities that have done that in the past. And then um, grant programs um, that can be um, offered for different, um, different kinds of rehabilitation work. And there's uh, lots of communities that offer um, grant programs. Um, and um, you know, often, um, more specifically, facade improvement grants, um, trying to help rehabilitate um, the facades of commercial properties. And then finally, um, thinking about just recognizing the work that's being done in your community and um, publicizing that so that um, people have great examples to look toward and then also um, recognize the hard work that your property owners are putting in um, to invest in their uh, local community. Um, so I think I'll stop there. I can. Okay, um, and Gail put this in chat, but thank you again, Lindsay and Sarah for joining us. And thanks for using, I, I noticed um, a lot of Main Street um, pictures and examples and um, always <laughs> enjoy seeing them getting some, some notice here. Um, I also wanna mention Sarah and Lindsay will be joining us again in June um, to discuss a little bit more and go into a little bit more depth about how to layer some of these incentives and other incentives to, to really try to bring down the cost of preservation work. It's, it's an expensive and uh, long-term proposition to do preservation and, and to do it right. And um, uh, there's assistance out there to um, uh, help out with that. So we appreciate them uh, coming back to us with that information um, in a couple of months. Um, I know we're right at time, um, but I just want to check to see if there were any last questions. I do see, do you have example documents? Oh yes, Lindsay already responded yeah. to it in Thanks. chat. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you all again for um, joining us today. We'll have this online if you wanna share this with um, any of your colleagues who weren't able to join us today. Um, 
And again, thank you to our partners at the State Historical Fund for providing this information um, for our communities. Great. Bye, Ron. See ya.